This week, DJI released the new Osmo Action 5. Now, this camera has been widely leaked. However, whilst we knew a lot, we didn't know everything. Now, I don't have one. This isn't a review. I don't have one here to show you. But this video is going to be me sharing with you some of my thoughts on what I've seen and giving you some things that you need to know before you consider buying this. And I'm also going to be sharing with you a bit of a secret about something that lays under the hood on this camera, something rather unexpected. Expected. Now, just before we get into this, I just want to say if you like what you see here, don't forget to subscribe as always. If you want to support the channel, there will also be links to my Patreon, Discord, and buy me a coffee down below as well. Okay, so as I've said, this isn't a review. More than anything, it's going to be a quick overview of the Osmo Action 5 Pro. Yes, DJI are calling this a pro camera. I actually called out some of the features on this camera a little while ago. I said as a reply to one of the Twitter leakers for DJI products that the pro in this camera will probably be support for the DJI mic system, and I actually got that one right. However, there is a lot that's changed here, but not everything is better on this camera, and there are a few little odd limitations that whilst they may have been mentioned in reviews, they've somewhat been glossed over as well. As always with DJI and what's always interesting to look at is not what is said, but actually what isn't said because the devil is always in the detail with DJI and you need to sort of look between the numbers of what they're not telling you about to find the really interesting information. Now, something that is particularly interesting about the Action 5 Pro compared to the new GoPro Hero 13 is the fact that this is actually an all-new camera. When we start looking at the details on this, I'll go through it a bit more, but the fact is DJI have completely redesigned this compared to GoPro, who basically took the 12, put it in a new casing to force you to go out and buy all your accessories again. DJI, on the other hand, have completely redesigned it. The camera is still based on a 1 over 1.3 inch sensor. However, it is an all new sensor. It now has dual OLED displays. It has built in storage. It has what they're calling a high performance 4 nanometer chip. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute because that's the very interesting bit. It has professional air pressure and water sensors. It has Wi Fi 6 and it now supports DJI. Osmo audio, which means you can use it directly with DJI's mics. Now, I'm not going to go through all of the nitty gritty detail, but the very basics are as a result of the changes, DJI have been able to massively improve the battery life on this camera compared to others, including the previous version. Now, when it comes to the main specs on this camera, I'm not going to go through everything, but there are some improvements, but there is also some regression here as well compared to the previous model. With regards to its size and weight, you can see it there and it weighs 146 grams. If we go down to the information with regards to the supported recording modes, so you've got 4K in 4x3 up to 120 frames a second. You've got 4K 16x9 up to 120 frames a second. It still supports all of the usual DJI stability modes. It still has the same version of Rocksteady. It isn't a new version of Rocksteady compared to the previous camera. And overall, there are some improvements here, including much better low light capabilities. They call it Super Night Mode, which supports 4K up to 30 frames a second. Now, whilst all of this new stuff looks great, there is a little bit of regression here compared to the previous model, and that comes in the bit rates. If you scroll down here, this camera supports HEVC just like the previous model. However, it is now limited to 100 megabits a second. The previous Osmo Action, the Osmo Action 4, actually supported up to 130 megabits a second. Now, this is actually quite a big step back compared to the Osmo Action 4 and even a bigger step back compared to the GoPro. What's even more worrying about this isn't the fact that you've dropped from 130 megabits to 100. It's the fact that in 4K 30, this camera doesn't even hit 100 megabits a second. And in fact, it's limited to less than 60. I've been shared some footage directly from this camera in 4K30 and others, and everything I've seen so far shows that it will only go to between 57 and 58 megabits a second in 4K30, and the only way to get towards that 100 megabits a second is in the higher frame rates. 
Now, it isn't clear why DJI have limited it in this way at this moment in time, but that is a massive step down compared to what we had before. But if you compare it to the GoPro, it's even bigger. GoPro have their high bandwidth mode, which allows over 160 megabits a second as well. And whilst it might not quite hit that in 30 frames a second, it's over 130 megabits from the footage that I have seen. Now, it isn't clear why DJI have chosen to limit this this way. DJI have said that this camera is based on a new 4 nanometer high performance chip. However, they are saying this is a high performance chip and it doesn't make sense that there is this limitation when they have improved the performance from it. What is interesting is what that chip actually is, because in previous models, DJI has flip-flopped between the chipsets that they've used. For instance, the Osmo Action 4 was using their in-house E3T chipset, the same chipset that you will find in the likes of the DJI Avata 2, the DJI Neo, the DJI O3 system, and many of their other consumer camera drones. The E3T chipset is really a stable of DJI's video processing system. What is interesting is that DJI have now moved away from their own in-house chipset, and I can reveal that DJI is actually using a Qualcomm chipset in the Osmo Action 5 Pro. And that chipset is the Qualcomm QCS8550. This is a high-end chipset designed for IoT and video action camera style applications. When you look through it, it contains a lot of very high-end specs. For instance, the CPU on this is an 8 core processor. There is one prime core up to 3.36 gigs. There are four performance cores up to 2.8 gigs and three efficiency cores up to two gigs. That's a similar layout to what you've seen from Intel or Snapdragon on their new chipsets for the Windows systems. However, whilst it might not be quite as powerful as the new Elite chipset, it's a lot more powerful than anything that I believe we've seen in an action camera before. It also has one of Qualcomm's GPUs on board. It supports Wi-Fi 7. And this thing is really at the top end of the scale of performance chipsets for this style of application. Now, I'm not going to go through every detail, but when you start diving into it, this chipset has so many capabilities. For instance, it supports video decode up to 4K to 40 frames a second or 8K 60, video encode up to 4K 120 or 8K 30. It has AV1 decode built in as well. It has an audio DSP. It has PCIe, huge amount of I.O., huge amount of capability, and DJI only seem to have just scratched the surface here of what this chipset is capable of delivering. Now, it is very interesting that DJI have chosen a chipset that isn't in-house, isn't based in China, and this actually goes directly against the moves that we've seen from DJI in recent times to basically build their drones from entirely Chinese components like you see here on the Neo. DJI most likely has been backed into a corner on this one, and that is as a result of power usage. Because whilst the E3T has been good enough, what it isn't is exactly efficient. It is one of the reasons why you see so much heat in the DJI O3 system. DJI have to bake in a lot of cooling into their other products, and there's no way that DJI was easily able to just spin up a new version of the E3T that was going to meet the power delivery requirements that you would need in a product like the Osmo Action 5. As a result of this, it's likely DJI have chose to go outside, and that is what they've chosen here with this new Qualcomm chipset. Now, this isn't the first time that DJI have used an outside chipset in their cameras. They have flip-flopped a little bit between their own chipset and the likes of Umbrella, but this is the first time that we've seen them move to something from Qualcomm, and it is very, very interesting indeed. Now, there is no question this new chipset and the reduction in bitrate go hand in hand. To me, DJI seem to have chosen to try and optimize battery life with the new Action 5 Pro above everything else. They've moved to a new chipset, which is a smaller node, which should improve consumption, lower heat. However, that 
doesn't seem to have got them over whatever line they were trying to reach. And as a result of that, they've now also gone down the road of reducing the bit rate as well. DJ actually seemed to back this up in a reply on Twitter. Someone asked them about the reduction in bit rates and DJ replied that a higher bit rate can significantly reduce the camera's battery life and lead to excessive heating. And they also go on to say, our algorithms help mitigate the quality loss that may occur from this adjustment. It's worth noting in that comment that it says help mitigate and it doesn't say does mitigate. It is my findings looking at some of the footage and people's own comments from what they've seen in the reviews that whilst this camera looks very good in many aspects, it does appear to be struggling on the codec. There are compression artifacts visible, especially in the skies and others. And I personally think DJI have overdone it here. I would like to see DJI release a high bandwidth mode at the expense of battery life for this camera. I think they've set themselves a target battery life that they wanted to achieve and the chipset didn't get them there alone and now they've had to reduce the bitrate. But instead of doing that, they should also add a high bitrate option for people who don't care about the battery life, who don't want four hours and want to be able to compete with the likes of GoPro because not only is this regression compared to the Action 4, it is a big step back compared to the Hero 12 and 13. Now, as I've said, this isn't a review more than anything. This is just a bit of information and some of this you probably will not have found anywhere else. Right now, the camera looks interesting, but this limitation in 4K 30 and this limitation of 100 megabits a second really does mean you need to think very carefully before rushing into buying this camera. I'm still evaluating footage on this and there does appear to be some compromises here as a result of this reduction in bitrate. I would personally be a lot more comfortable if DJI could up that bit rate in 4K30 to at least 100 megabits a second to allow us to have the full capability in that mode. 60 megabits a second is quite a big step back compared to where we've been before. For instance, we only had 60 megabits a second on the old DJI Phantom 3. Yes, that was a different codec. That was H.264. This is H.265, but it is still a pretty big drop in bitrate compared to the previous models and it's quite a gap compared to the GoPro as I've said that has the high bandwidth mode of over 160 megabits a second. Now I'm going to probably order one of these. If you're interested in me doing that, please do let me know in the comment section. I can't really offer you any more information than I have here today because I don't have it. But if you're interested in a review on this, there is some info from Sean at Geeks Varna and many of the other YouTubers out there have given you their DJI reviews as well. I may order one. I haven't decided yet. But if you do want to see me do a review on this camera, let me know in the comment section and that way I can understand what you would like to see from me. Anyway, that's it from me on this one. I hope you found it useful. Stay safe. I will speak to you soon.